When humanity began experimenting with quantum physics resulting in portals to other worlds and universes, it was only a matter of time before they stumbled across a species that was well aware of portal technology and perhaps even laid traps for advancing species who would open these portals so that they could be invaded. Well, this exact threat becomes a reality in the Half-Life series as humanity is conquered by interdimensional beings. Known as Nihilanus, this form of alien life has its own universe that seemingly has taken over other universes, which means its own laws of physics, and and ecosystems that exist within the confines of their space defined. Just like Earth's ecosystems, however, there exists predator and there exists prey. And sometimes what is prey in one world is a deadly predator in another. Humans in their own right are fairly dangerous predators, but only because of our large brains, which allowed us to outthink the less intelligent beasts around us. But what would happen should an alien predator learn how to interact with those brains and control it? Well, this is exactly what we see with the head crabs from Half-Life 1, 2, and hopefully Half-Life three someday. So with that setup concluded, let's discuss the morphological changes to the host as well as how the head crab uses its naturally occurring abilities to tap into the human mind and maintain control. As with all things, there is a beginning. When humans first opened the portal to the Zen universe, an explosion caused the portal to become unstable, which paved the way for the wildlife on the other side to begin making their way through. When this happened, it seems that the first thing to make it through were the head crabs. But prior to any of this happening, humanity had sent a forward operating team essentially to the other side of the portal to catalog and study the naturally occurring flora and fauna. Keep in mind though, nothing is really native to the Zen universe, but instead it is a border dimension leaking other universes and as such, other types of creatures have come over from their own universe. Anyhow, here, many would be lost even with their protective HEV suits on. Head crabs would latch onto the skull of a person and begin piloting that individual for an indeterminate amount of time, or at least as long as it took Gordon Freeman to cross the portal barrier and emerge in the Zen universe. Anyhow, Anyhow, upon being released on the scientists and ill-equipped security personnel, changes to their bodies began happening at alarming rates as it took almost no time at all to completely overtake a human's mind as well as their body. First though, let's discuss the head crab, which is considered to be the most standard and what the effects are on this person. From there, we will move on to the other variants and finally discuss how this creature is able to do what it does. And trust me, it'll definitely be more than just interacts with your nervous system somehow, because what kind of scientist would I be if I at least didn't take a crack at it? The first head crab we see is in Half-Life 1, and it is really just a standard on Earth at this point. So it's just known as Head Crab. Amazing name, right? Well, this particular creature is roughly the size of a turkey and looks like one that has already been defeathered. It stalks around the areas, producing a quiet screeching noise, looking for any heads to jump on. Its body is fairly round in shape with smooth and yellow white skin on its back. It has four legs in total, much like the quadrupeds on Earth, with two legs up front and two in the back. The front legs are long and the back legs are used more for jumping distances. Two toes on the back of the leg give it the ability to push off the ground, adding force, but also a secondary ability, which is digging into a human's shoulders to hold on to the victim. The front claws are also presumably there to dig into the front pectoral muscles to aid it in holding on, and may even go as far as getting underneath the clavicles, which sit at the top of the rib cage to provide a better grip. What could be considered a face is nothing more than two larger appendages on each side, with two smaller appendages in the middle. At the end of these appendages, they are tipped with a black, sharp fang, presumably used to hold hold onto prey, even better should they be struggling. The underbelly of your standard head crab has teeth flanking each side and a massive hole in the middle. And speaking of massive opening, this is the main attraction concerning the head crab. This cavernous opening is quite large enough and shockingly can encompass an entire human head. When it does this, the hidden beak will come into play. This beak will presumably crack into the skull of a person, which allows them to be controlled indefinitely. This beak though is apparently something that inspires aggression in the parasitic nature of the head crab. As with neutering and spaying animals on Earth, causing them to become much calmer, removal of this beak on this head crab caused them to become more docile and actually capable of being domesticated. We see this with Lamar. Unfortunately for anyone involved, it will still try to couple with your head, which, uh... Yes or no, Frank? It's gotta be no, dog. Something to note about the head crab, though, is that while humanity does stumble across it in the Zen, this doesn't mean they are native to this area, because once again, absolutely nothing is really native to the Zen environment. So for this to exist on the head crab, or at least like a hole like that, then presumably there must have been more humanoid-like creatures in their native environment, allowing them to specialize into the head crabs we see. So maybe it's just happen chance or just bad luck, but these creatures can be used as a living weapon. We see this when the Combine drop the head crabs from the sky to permeate an area and attack the resistance troops. They spread in all directions, quickly latching onto any humans or even possibly burrowing underground should there be none around. But one of the things that's interesting is humans are likely the preferred prey because they're very 
similar to how these creatures evolved, but we will discuss that later on with the body. When the head crab does latch onto a person, many changes happen to the body. Some would seem to outright be lethal to the victim. First, their hands appear to lose all the skin and instead become quite skeletal in appearance. At this point, it really just becomes a claw which is used to slash and hit anyone nearby, injuring them. They have also been known to knock objects towards people, causing injury to them as well. How do they do this? Well, it's actually completely plausible. The muscle would need to become quite strong, which is totally possible from a biological perspective, but we will cover that later. The ribcage and abdomen also appear to be split open on this person. Organs will be completely exposed to the atmosphere, which in theory should lead to the person's expiration, but somehow this person is still very much alive. Muffled screams of help and pain can be heard underneath the head crab, which means this fate is one of the worst for the person. Mercy put down is definitely advised. So the first head crab is sort of like a new player in a new ecosystem, but with all things, random mutations or those just lucky enough to reproduce go on, and this causes the creature to adapt and change to their surroundings. Specifically in Ravenholm, we begin to see changes happening amongst the head crab population, probably due to humanity's naturally occurring intelligence towards climbing buildings and running away from head crabs, which means perhaps the original humanoid creatures the head crabs hunted may have been beings who were not as smart or not as fast as humans. But this original prey doesn't stop the head crabs from adapting to hunt their new prey. This is the head crab that Earth has designed, and as such, it has gotten better at fitting into a niche as predator, seeing as humans have no natural predators. Their body reflects their speed and ability to climb, becoming what appears to be more streamlined and efficient, they seem to be more gangly. No longer having the two back stumpy legs, their back legs are now about the same size as their front limbs. This makes them able to run quicker and at higher speeds, as well as leap even further than their predecessors. On each foot, a large, singular claw has grown out to be about one-third the size of its entire leg. This claw would presumably be used not only to pierce into the prey around the rib section, but also climb up the walls. This made human prey hiding on top of buildings accessible to them. Their center mass has also slimmed down and more sleek than their original form. The front fangs now appear to be completely disappeared, as they were more than likely added weight that wasn't necessary for what they were hunting. The underbelly of these creatures is still the same, however. They're still quite capable of taking over a human's head, but there are many different changes that this induces in the person as opposed to the standard head crab form. First, I'm not a doctor yet, but I have taken quite a few human anatomy courses, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say the body's ability to survive wounds is pretty good, but this is well beyond anything that is possible for a person. So presumably, whatever made them human originally is no longer there. Instead, we find a creature who has completely lost all of its skin and several mutations have allowed it to survive thus far. Across the whole body, except for the possible backs of the palms and hands, we see no skin and instead there's exposed bone, muscle, and tendons. At this point, it is unknown how the body could be surviving, but I have a theory on it, which just like everything I've said, I'm gonna discuss later. Pretty much just wait till the end of the video because you're gonna get like a ton of information. Concerning their abdomen region, no internal organs remain on this person. Instead, they have become nothing but a skeletal muscle and skeleton. And considering we're approaching October, at any rate, the body is broken down, but it still remains agile. The creature now runs on all fours, much like how a chimpanzee does, which is quite apropos considering that the person is sort of having their body devolve into chaos, so why not their mind? When idle, squawks and babbling can be heard, but when they begin their attacks, the screams for help have now been replaced by whales. Due to the body's ability to operate and the whales coming from somewhere within, it can be assumed that internally the lungs must still be there in some capacity to produce this sound, and the brainstem must be functional to control the rest of the nervous system. The hands are longer sporting claws that are almost a fourth as long as the arms. Their claws are mainly just the index, middle, and ring finger, with the thumbs and pinkies not really seemingly have grown at all. These claws can be used to slash at people as well as climb up walls. I would say that strangely the morphology of the head crab almost becomes the morphology of the human host. And then this brings us to our third and final form, the poisonous head crab. These particular creatures are absolutely devastating to humans as they appear to release a neurotoxin into the body of the person they are attacking. This toxin is so strong that it causes your suit to essentially go haywire and release a plethora of countermeasures into Gordon Freeman to neutralize it. However, imagine yourself without a suit, and the fact that your health drops from completely full to one, you can see how humans would be dropping left, right, and center when it comes to these variants. So this type of head crab is slimmer than their more standard cousins. The back legs are longer, much like the front legs, which suggests that this particular 
Predator variant has evolved on Earth more than likely from the fast head crabs that we see in Ravenholm. Perhaps spending more time with humanity, they have learned how to interact with our bodies, which allow them to produce this potent toxin. On this particular subspecies, the fangs are back and can be easily feud from the front with the two larger fangs on the sides and the smaller interior fangs in the middle. These appendages are tipped with the same black fang that we see in the standard head crabs. However, they are now curved. This would more than likely be used to inject the poison into the person. This delivery method is incredibly effective as we see it on our own planet with venomous snake fangs. The skin of this head crab is darker in color concerning the back and legs with some reddish hues and blacks being seen all throughout. While they do still have the ability to attach to the head of a person, they appear to be much more accepting of a group effort where they aren't really the ones that are driving, but one of them is. So as such, their internal body can accommodate an entire head, but it's not necessary. We see this quite clearly with the poisonous zombie. The poisonous zombie is likely a creature who is no longer mentally present. Well, I say creature, but he's really a person. In fact, I would go as far as to say that the human may only still be living in the standard head crab zombie form because it has not fully integrated with the body as it lacks some crucial component, and as such, the person is still there. With the fast head crab and the poisonous head crab, these creatures completely knock out the human component and take over the body. So luckily for this person, they are long gone. As such, we can see the results of what happened to their shambling form. Poisonous zombie is constantly leaned over, not from a weight issue, but because the back erector muscles that flank either side of the spine are now gone. As such, it leans over. The body has become bloated for presumably one of two reasons. Either the head crabs are storing the neurotoxin in the host, causing the body to react as such, or they are eating him. Personally, I subscribe to the idea that they are eating him. Bite marks all over the arm seem to show that the poisonous head crabs are pulling blood to the surface from the body and draining it. This can cause inflammation in the body, which makes them swell. This is because I believe that the neurotoxin does not need to be stored in a person, but instead is just produced in the head crab. One head crab is the driver, the other two or three kind of hitch a ride to form a type of colony. After an attack, they will jump off and begin to attack any person who initiated that aggression. Much like the other head crabs, claws are used quite standardly and are grown. So let's discuss though in general these changes to the body concerning all three variants. We see that they are quite lethal amounts of damage to the body. So this would indicate to me that something else is going on for them not to drop and expire. As seen with the mother head crab, it's called a gonarch and exactly why you think so. About where roughly the body should be, there seems to be this type of sack there. So where did it come from? This head crab is considered to be a mother head crab and is much larger than her offspring. To me, only one conclusion really comes to mind. The reproduction area of this head crab is the remains of a humanoid. This is why they go out and seek creatures to control, because this is how their parasitic life cycle continues. But for something to become a part of the head crab, it must also survive. As such, after the head crab attaches to the person, they will begin to break down that person in some ways, but it is a slow process evidently. This could explain why the body just isn't straight up decomposing underneath the head crab as it takes too much damage. The body of the head crab may fill the human host body with some sort of localized immune system stemming from the head crab, which allows it to continue past decomposition where it would usually occur from injury and begin basically melting away. In these standard head crabs, we see a cracked rib cage in the abdomen. Easily enough controlled by the head crab, it would keep the host going. In the fast head crab, we see that all the skin has been lost and there's nothing but muscle and bone. The body would need to be preserved somehow by the head crab, so perhaps there is an excretion that allows the body to maintain a barrier through say like a film that is not really seen by us because it's incredibly thin. Then getting to the poison head crab, the body is kept alive despite being nommed. And it also, just from my perspective, appears to be looking more and more like a gonarch. Over time, the body of the host will be completely broken down and become this gonarch, and their cells will supply the head crab with the ability to make more head crabs, good lord I'm saying head crabs a lot, which we see when you attack the mother and then baby head crabs exit out of the body and begin to attack you. A human is simply absorbed into the head crab in later stages, but in earlier stages, it's more used for locomotion and defense. So as promised, how does any of this even work? Well, apart from the morphological changes, there may be quite a few things going on leading to those quick changes that we see in the standard head crab zombie. When a person is attacked, the body of the head crab aligns on the head where what would be considered a face faces the front. This is important as the back is pressed firmly against the back of the head. So two things need to happen, which based on clues in game seems to be the case. First, the back beak needs to pierce the skull of the person, or at minimum, the neck. The front beak needs to pierce the roof of the mouth. And this is what evidently happens as the jaw is usually forced open on a zombie and they are stuck in a screaming position. But why these areas? 
Should the back beak pierce the cerebellum, motor function could be controlled, but this might be too difficult to do considering many instructions for movements come from this area. In my mind, I believe it pierces the brainstem. Here, it can control a person and move them at will. This would also give them that shambling jerky walk as it doesn't have complete control over the fine-tuned nervous system. Instead, it's just bulk walk. This would also allow the cerebellum to remain intact. This is how the person can still scream for help. They can still control some of the finer muscles in their jaw. However, they may as well be a quadriplegic when it comes to the rest of their body as the beak piercing their brainstem means that they cannot will their muscles to move nor send any signals to override the back beak. This would make sense that this is happening as if you've seen any of my other videos, then you know that the brain limits our strength. It's built in to protect our muscle, but with the head crab at the helm, our strength is not controlled and the limbs and muscle are expendable. This is why the head crab zombie can throw heavy objects, slash at people causing great injury, or survive damage to its body that would more than likely put any other human down. It's because the muscles will work well past what our brains allow. So what does the front beak do? It would more than likely pierce the roof of the mouth and head to the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Here are the electrical signals that the Zen are known for, at least animals in the Zen, could interact with this crucial area of the brain, allowing them to release hormones, specifically human growth hormone. This would push the body to heal, but would also do things like cause bone growth and muscle growth. Muscle growth, making them stronger. Bone growth would grow the claws, as well as crack the ribs due to the ribs pushing outwards. This in turn would cause the head crab zombie we see. The head crab tapping into the brain and understanding the human host would be something in my mind that is quite evident, because as head crabs do this, they will begin to learn more about their prey. As such, they develop other forms to become more effective hunters, and eventually even learn what sort of neurotoxin works best on humans. The head crabs, while lowly prey creatures, presumably quite low actually on the food chain in the Zen universe, are absolutely devastating when it comes to humans. As is quite usual when you introduce a new species into a new area, sometimes the alpha predator is not as alpha when it comes to another world or species. Anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope everyone enjoyed. If you did, leaving a like helps the video get out there and subbing is a great way to keep up with the channel. I will drop my Twitter, Discord, merch, and Patreon links in the description if you are interested and I would like to thank a few of my patrons. It's Not A Spoon, Joseph Gibbons, Freedom Units 44, and The Lone Titan. Thank you guys for your awesome support. And to the rest of my patrons, I really do appreciate it. EMT school has started, so Patreon's helping me pay for books and gas and food while I do all this. Anyhow, thanks for watching, guys, and I will see y'all in the next one.